Welcome to the Steam version of Combat Mission Black Sea, where we're going to attack the Gargarina Avenue checkpoint. This scenario is set in the early days of Battlefront's hypothetical Russian invasion of Ukraine, just south of Kharkov. Our force is tasked with attacking a Ukrainian checkpoint as part of the Russian effort to encircle and seal off the city. So we have two ground objectives at the far side of the map, objectives Vokshod and Vostok, which are occupy objectives worth 50 points each. Then there are another 100 points on the table for destroying Ukrainian units. To get this done, we've got a roughly company-sized combined arms force. Starting out, we have a reinforced scout section in two MTLB-6MAs. These are pretty much just tracked transporters with BTR turrets, so a lightly armoured box with a heavy machine gun and coax on top. The scout section itself is a bit of a mixed bag of specialist teams. We have a scout team, an LMG team with a PKP, a breach team with demolition charges, and a two-man HQ element with SVD marksman rifles. Backing them up is a platoon of motor rifle infantry and BMP-3s. The BMP-3 is an interesting vehicle. It has paper-thin armour, can somehow transport 10 passengers, and has a total of 5 weapons. A turret mount with a 100mm gun and coaxial 30mm cannon and PK machine gun, plus 2 more PKs in ball mounts on the front hull for use by the passengers. The 100mm gun can not only fire airburst and high explosive rounds, but also AT-10 anti-tank guided missiles, so that's a lot of firepower. The downside is that all that ammunition, combined with the weak armour, means that any penetrations are likely to detonate the entire vehicle. The infantry squads inside are only six men strong, so although they include a PKP light machine gun and an RPG-7, they don't really have enough strength for independent action. The BMP and the infantry are very much supposed to work together. In five minutes, the company HQ and a platoon of T-90 tanks will arrive, along with a Zala UAV, and support from a platoon of 120mm mortars. Finally, a second motor rifle platoon in BMP-3s is scheduled to pop in at the 10 minute mark. So overall, the force for this mission is high on firepower, but pretty low on infantry. That means I want to stay clear of infantry sentry actions, like clearing woodland or urban areas, and try and get the job done from a distance if I can. The terrain offers some good opportunities for this, but it's a double-edged sword. The map is mostly made up of large open fields surrounded by tree and bush covered embankments, with a string of compounds with buildings down the left map edge and a thickly wooded field boundary running down the right map edge. If I was defending this, then I would certainly want to set up a crossfire between the compounds and that wood line. There is some cover in the centre thanks to the low embankments for the roads, but nothing that really fills me with confidence as an attacker. So maybe the best way to deal with this is going to be to pick a flank. This will mean that the potential enemy weapons on the other flank will be operating at the greatest range, and in theory they will be less effective. Enemy spotting will generally be more difficult, and any incoming ATGMs will have more opportunities to collide with foliage or suffer other guidance issues. Of the two choices, I think going right would be a bad idea. That wood line basically represents a continuous danger area to clear, and there's probably going to be a short-ranged firefight at the end that I want to avoid. Going left, on the other hand, looks a little easier. I can attack the compounds from the bottom one at a time, and there's a decent looking fire support position offering some keyhole or defilated oblique fire thanks to the tall embankment just ahead of my setup zone. Moving up from one compound to another will steadily open up more angles on the objectives while remaining at distance, so I can expand the area I have under observation and hopefully move to reduce any threats as they appear, rather than risk being overwhelmed by them all at once. Of course, this sounds a lot easier than it's actually going to be. This is a pretty big map and almost all of it is open ground. From my setup zone to the comparative shelter of the nearest compound, is 800 meters of empty field, which may or may not be somebody's kill zone. So we immediately have a tactical issue on our hands. Obviously we need one element to push for the compound and one element to act as a base of fire. The natural division here seems to be to have the firepower of the BMP-3s as the fire support. So they're moving up to the first embankment, and detached scout teams are moving up on top to observe, while the BMPs themselves slot into firing positions covering the compound. That means that the scout section in its MTLBs is going to be making the rush. 
they're not the fastest vehicles in the world, but at least they have a pretty low profile. I can also use one of the BMP-3s to pop smoke. Russian smoke launchers throw their charges further than NATO ones, so hopefully some obscuration might give the running MTLB a bit of concealment on the way in. It's agonizingly slow, even using the fast command, but it makes it apparently without attracting any attention. A little urban remodeling with one of the BMP-3s opens up a gap in the compound wall for the scout team to slip through. In the meantime, the T-90s and the company HQ have arrived. I'm feeding the tanks into the base of fire by the embankment to support the scout section, while the forward observer with the HQ starts to set up a drone mission over the objective so I can get a good idea of what's over there. It'll take some time for that to come in though, so off goes the second MTLB with the rest of the scouts. There's more smoke cover this time, the forward MTLB has smoke launchers too, but as the second vehicle makes the crossing, there's an explosion in the distance. This is one of two things. Either the Ukrainians are trying to call in a fire mission and their artillery hates them, or someone in this direction took a pot shot at the MTLB and missed. Which is obviously good news for the scout section, they've all made it to that first compound, but I don't think they'll be getting any backup soon. On the next turn, one of the embankment scout teams spots the offending enemy unit. It's a Corsair ATGM on the roof of the gas station. The Corsair fires a laser beam riding 105mm tandem heat warhead out to 2.5km, and, and if that wasn't bad enough, it's shoulder fired and has a thermal imager. So it's something to be wary of, but at least like most ATGMs, it's going to have a pretty long flight time at this distance. They're not the fastest things in the world. In other words, now that I know where it is, a quick shoot and scoot should be relatively safe. So off goes a BMP-3 to take a shot. A 100mm airburst over that rooftop should get the job done. Unfortunately, the BMP-3's main gun is also a low velocity weapon. This means that not only does it take a long time for the round to go down range, but it's more important to correctly judge the distance. The first shot misses, and I'm not willing to hang around and try for another one. Instead, I'm shuffling a T-90 into position. This quickly scores a hit on the roof. It's difficult to know how much damage it's done, but if there are any Ukrainians up there, they're probably not having a good time. After a second hit for insurance, the T-90 reverses away too. There's no point hanging around waiting to get targeted. While this has been going on, there have been a couple more spots in the distance. The drone has spotted a BTR-4E in Objective Vostok, which is in a pretty good position. It's in defilade behind a building and also looking out through a keyhole between the right wood line and the diagonal wood in the objective. The BTR-4E is a Ukrainian development of the BTR, with almost as many weapons on board as the BMP-3. In the remote control turret there's a 30mm cannon with coax PK, plus barrier ATGMs and a 30mm automatic grenade launcher. While it's not something I really want to get in front of, it's basically just small arms proof, so like almost all the IFVs in Black Sea, it's a bit of a glass cannon. The second spot is a radio man, legging it down the highway from right to left, heading towards the far compounds. He could be a member of a HQ unit, but more worryingly he could be part of a forward observer team looking for an elevated spotting position. Either way, he's a high value target, so one of the T-90s and a BMP-3 takes some pot shots as he passes. The range is a bit long though, and the Ukrainians have probably gotten away with it. Meanwhile, the scout team has legged it across to the next compound. Finding it clear, the breach team follows them over, and soon the whole section minus its vehicles has moved up. This has finally opened up some good sight lines into the objectives. The drone has spotted another two BTR-4Es up in that corner, but the scouts are now actually in position to see some of them. This raises an opportunity. The 100mm mortar battery on call has some precision ammunition, some grand high explosive bombs, which could easily take out the BTRs. The downside is that these rounds are laser guided, and I'd need a unit up there with a laser designator to paint the targets. Of course, the only unit I have with a laser designator is the forward observer back at the embankment, so if I want to smack those BTRs around with precision munitions, I've got to get him over to the compounds. This is a very different cost-benefit question to sending the scout section across. The FO is far more valuable. It is a little risky, but I think it's going to be worth taking the chance. 
the first thing to do is to cancel the drone mission. That way I won't lose the drone if the FO is killed and get everything in position to make the run. With smoke cover at either end and the centre T90 rolling forward to engage the Corsair roof again, just in case, the BMP dashes across. It's much faster than the MTLBs and makes it safely in a single turn, much to my relief. I am running short on time though. It not only takes another two turns to run the FO up to the next compound, but another to actually spot one of the BTRs, and then the game is indicating it'll take six more minutes to call a fire mission in, and we're already 30 minutes into the game with 40 to go. Clearly, I'm going to have to start making some forward progress soon, so the first BTR to be targeted is the one in the keyhole covering the left. This will reduce the known threat to the closer half of the map and hopefully allow me to push up. Unfortunately, I have been taking too long. The drone, now operated by the company HQ, spots two Ukrainian tanks rolling into position. We didn't notice these before, so they're probably reinforcements, and while they look like somewhat antiquated T-64 Ulats, they're still tanks. Worse, as they come onto the map, one turns left and looks to be taking up position by the BTR I'm targeting with the mortars. Realistically, it doesn't change very much. When the mortars come in, they'll hopefully knock out that BTR and throw up a lot of smoke and dust. I'm planning to roll the T-90 platoon out at the same time, and they should have the advantages of numbers, range, more modern fire control and ammunition over that single bullet. The heavy mortars come in a turn earlier than I was expecting, and while they don't score any direct hits, they're enough to knock out the BTR. So off go the T-90s. These are much better at dealing with most pop-up threats than the BMP-3s, thanks to their much higher velocity 125mm guns, plus they're considerably better protected. Obviously they have thicker armour and some explosive reactive armour that might help against any hits the enemy scores, but they also have some more active defensive equipment. To help defend against ATGMs, they have Stora electro-optical dazzlers on either side of the turret. Exactly how these work probably requires another video in itself, but the quick version is that they mess with the guidance signals of most Saklos type guided missiles. The second, more active system comes into play as one of the T-90s crosses the road. The T-64 in the gap spots and lasers it as it reverses over the road embankment, triggering the laser warning receiver. This alerts the crew that they're being pinged and automatically slews the turret round to aim down the incoming laser beam before popping smoke. The T-90 reverses away off the embankment and out of danger. So now we know that the Bulak can see us out here, which is bad news for the Ukrainian tank because that means the T-90s should be able to see it too. I start peeling them up the road, leapfrogging the tank at the back of the platoon to the front while the two others keep watch. This is a nice simple form of lateral fire and movement. And it pays off. One of the T-90s suddenly spots the T-64 and takes it out with a fin round to the turret. It's a long shot, about 1200 meters, but that's not that far for modern tanks. Meanwhile, although the FO has moved up to get eyes on the second T-64, forward movement on the left edge has petered out. The scout team made a move on the next compound, but were taken out by a Ukrainian marksman team in a three-story building up ahead. The marksman didn't last very long after getting spotted. I'd managed to cheekily squeeze the two MTLBs and the FO's BMP-3 along the map edge to a position where they could engage, but unfortunately that's come a little too late for the scout team. With the T-90s quickly reaching a position up by the scouts, it's time to start moving the motor rifle platoons forward too. This is a different exercise than advancing with tanks. A BMP-3 full of infantry getting hit is a loss I can really do without, so after loading up, they're dashing out and hugging the edge of the road embankment in the next field as they rush forward. A push in this direction is still going to be exposed to any more Ukrainians in the left edge compounds though, so with the added on-hand support of the T-90s, the scout light machine gun team moves up to take a closer look. Passing their wounded comrades, who tried to do exactly the same thing only a few minutes ago, they make it. The compound seems clear, and soon the team are up on the top floor where they spot some Ukrainian troops in foxholes on top of the T-junction and start taking pot shots. They don't get any return fire, and because I'd expect anything in the final two compounds to respond to the LMG opening up, this means that they're probably clear. Or probably clear of direct threats. 
as the motor rifle platoons move up, the enemy starts dropping mortars nearby. The BMP3s are pretty much safe from anything except close and direct hits, and they're not hanging around in that area, so the incoming fire is ineffective as long as I stay away. My own 120mm mortars finally drop in on the remaining T-64, scoring two near misses and a direct but non-penetrating hit on the turret roof. This isn't too bad. The probable effects are some damage to the tracks and optics, which will help degrade the overall performance of the Bulat. With that mission out of the way and the clock steadily advancing, the FO starts organising a final fire mission to expend the remaining ammunition in the woods on that objective. This seems like a likely place for the enemy to be dug in, and with any luck I might hit some of the BTRs nearby too. I want to coordinate the final push with my mortars though. I want to close the range while the enemy is suppressed and blinded by smoke and dust, so the BMP3s start to spread out. One of the platoons crosses over the embankment and starts to move out across the field towards the next boundary to set up another base of fire, but they quickly lose their momentum. This field is entirely made up of mud, and even though the ground condition is dry, the vehicles have to slog their way forward from bogging to bogging. One of them bogs so hard it becomes immobilised. The infantry inside have to get out and jog the rest of the way, with enemy mortar rounds falling behind them. But at least the stranded BMP has eyes on areas of the objective and can start lobbing 100mm shells at anything that looks vaguely suspicious. As my mortars come in, the company HQ in the rear watches via the drone as the Ukrainians start to make a move. The T-64 rolls out of the woods, briefly lazing over the T-90s, which is again quickly concealed behind laser warning triggered smoke, and the BTRs start to follow. It's difficult to tell if this is intended to be a concerted counterattack designed to catch my motor rifle infantry in the open, or an attempt to get away from the incoming mortars, but it quickly goes wrong for the Ukrainians. The first BTR pauses to negotiate their own checkpoint, and is hit by an AT-11 missile from T-90 before being finished off with a sabo round. The next BTR runs into the back of it, and struggles to sort itself out before it's spotted by the tank platoon HQ and taken out with another missile. That's all well and good, but my main concern here is the T-64 Bulat. It's rolled forward past the gas station to a hull down position in a U of road embankments where it's facing down my incoming assault. It's a serious threat in a good position, as it demonstrates by lazing another T-90. At least the gun seems to be super elevated and very slow to move, so perhaps the weapon control suffered some damage from the mortar hit. The Bulat is forcing me to slow down when I'm running out of time. The simple act of moving forward 200 meters and getting in the way is panning out pretty well for the defenders here. The tricky part is actually spotting it. I know it's there, but the careful forward movement of the T-90s and the flanking motor rifle platoons aren't quite making the spot, while rushing the FO's BMP-3 up to the LMG team's building ends in disaster as the T-64 quickly spots and destroys it. Eventually though, supported by BMP-3s blind firing 100mm air bursting shells on top of it, the T-90 platoon HQ makes the spot. Its first shot is intercepted by a tree, but the Bulat doesn't react and the T-90 quickly follows up, putting a thin round through the turret. With that threat removed, and only 11 minutes left, the motor rifle platoons can finally close in for the final assault. It's a little behind schedule, and the mortar fire mission is just about ending, but there should be about enough time. Closing the distance reveals new targets and opens up new angles, allowing the BMP-3s to hit Ukrainian infantry in the ditch beneath Objective Voxhod, and one of the T-90s to take out a fourth BTR-4E. On the flanks, it's starting to look like the enemy is trying to collapse in onto the objectives for a last stand. A stream of infantry contacts is spotted running along the main road from the left edge compounds, and a few spots pop up moving through the right edge woodline. In response, the woodline is hammered, and my deploying infantry opposite the wreck of the last Bulat engage the main road contacts along with their BMP-3s. Of course, the Ukrainians out in the open have a bad day, but stopping to engage them and I have to stop to engage them if I want to be sure I don't have any RPGs on my flank, is costing me more time that I don't have. 
With their BMPs in close support, the infantry start moving into the objective. More Ukrainians pop up in the ditch, leading to some close-in fighting as the Russians clear them out with hand grenades. The T-90s move up to the checkpoint itself and engage stragglers on the main road, and I have a pair of fully loaded BMP-3s standing by to rush into the final objective, but there's enough residual resistance from the Ukrainians to put me off a final roll of the dice. I might essentially just be mopping up here, but when everyone has an assault rifle and even little teams of enemy soldiers could easily have light one-shot anti-tank weapons capable of taking out a T-90 with a lucky shot to the sides or rear, I'm not inclined to push my luck. With one final hurrah from the immobilized BMP-3 getting lucky with a burst of blind 30mm cannon fire and nailing the last BTR, the timer runs out and the game ends. The result is a minor victory for the Russians. I've got 79 points to the Ukrainians 53. I've missed out on securing the two objectives, though at least I've denied one of them to the enemy. The big difference is in the casualties. I've lost two dead and three wounded, plus a single BMP-3. Interestingly enough, all of these were in the same area, and they are all killed out in the open, moving between pieces of cover but I've inflicted 42 dead, 16 wounded, and destroyed 2 tanks and 5 out of 6 BTR-4Es. Overall, I think this one just came down to waiting too long before committing to the attack. Even another 5 minutes at the end would have probably been enough to clear out the objective areas and seal the deal, or provoke the Ukrainians to surrender, and I could easily have shaved that 5 minutes off earlier on. Perhaps the time invested in getting the forward observer over to the left edge compounds to set up those precision fire missions could have been better spent sending the T-90s forward. The FO only bagged a single BTR and dinged one of the T-90s after all. Probably not the best use of time. But on the flip side, this is still a victory. Our Russian element might be a couple of minutes behind schedule in neutralizing this checkpoint, but they've taken minimal casualties in the process. Hope you all enjoyed this one. Black Sea is a much more dangerous battlefield than even Shock Force. You should be able to get stuck into it on Steam by the time this is released, and I'll see you in the next video.